Well, I'm standing by for Professor Fu to start. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, then uh, let's get started. Um, uh, good evening, everyone, and also good morning to those in, in Europe. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, webinar jointly organized by the Behavior and Knowledge Engineering Research Center and the Hong Kong Knowledge Management Society. Uh, the Behavior and Knowledge Engineering Research Center, or BAKE, BAKE for short, uh, focused on behavior engineering and design of human-centered systems. The research center was set up in 2007 uh, under the name of KMRRC initially uh, in the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. It has a core group of practitioners and researchers in organizational learning, cultural and change, uh, intellectual capital management, knowledge audit, knowledge system, and e-learning. Uh, the center has also established a strong international alliances with leading practitioners and renowned research centers uh, worldwide. Uh, the center's core work falls into three areas, research, we are in universities, research, professional services and consultancy, and teaching and training. Uh, the center is actively engaged in various research activities and research projects. The research results mostly have been disseminated through the publication of research papers. It has also participated in uh, various uh, exhibitions, organized seminars, training sessions for different industrial sectors. The center op operates uh, executive short courses in knowledge management. Uh, furthermore, there's many, many customized KM workshops have been designed and delivered for government departments, private enterprise uh, in different, different uh, regions, including Hong Kong, mainland China, Australia, Malaysia, and Brunei, for, just to name just but a few. Okay? So today, um, uh, I hope you'd enjoy this webinar delivered by Professor Eric Tse, who is the Associate Director of BAKE. Uh, without any further delay, uh, um, I would welcome you to the webinar and uh, hope you enjoy it and look forward to your participation in additional BAK activities in the days to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Fu. I'd, I'd also like to uh, welcome you all to this webinar. And it's so good to have so many people interested in, in knowledge management and the technical developments we can see right now. Uh, my name is Les Hales. I'm the president of the Hong Kong Knowledge Management Society. We were established in 2001, and we've a society essentially of practitioners. We like to bring people who actually practice KM within their organizations together. Um, I have to say that we were we, things were very lively for us in the in the 2000s, and when knowledge management was really a a top item on many companies' agendas and. Uh, we had speakers like Leif is on the call today. We had many of the KM thought leaders around the world, uh, people like Dave Snowden, Nicholas Gordostani, Ron Young, et cetera, who really pioneered a lot of de developments in the field of knowledge management. But I have to say in the last few years, the knowledge management has slipped down the, the, the top management, the CEO board issues. But I'm, I'm also excited to say that technology is driving back the interest because as we see more and more of a digital transformation, which is not only transforming businesses, but also uh, our political lives and our econ economic lives, the digital transformation is leading to a, a, a tremendous uh, aggregation of data. And we know that data without meaning is meaningless. Uh, 42 can mean a street address, somebody's age, or the answer to the life, the, the universe and everything. We need, we need knowledge, and the knowledge is going to come partly through artificial intelligence, but at the end, I think it's going to push back the fact that human knowledge is really important to catalyze data and, and turn it into value. And when I talk about human knowledge, I talk about know-how, I talk about know-what, I talk about know-who, which is all about collaboration, and I talk about the other thing, know-when, which is a, a very important aspect of, of knowledge, knowing when it's the right time, et cetera. So with that, um, I'd like to finish my little introduction and pass the real, the star of our 
show today, <laughs> Professor Choi, who's going to talk and blend a number of themes together, it, the Industrial Revolution 4.0, knowledge management, and the metaverse. So, Eric, the, the screen is all yours. Thank you, uh, Les, and thank you, uh, Professor Fu, uh, for the opening, and uh, welcome uh, for uh, all of you joining this uh, webinar, and uh, no matter where you are. Now, I must confess, uh, I haven't shared my uh, PowerPoint uh, or presentation material with Les, but uh, his two minutes seem to be a, a succinct uh, roundup of what I want to say <laughs> in, the, uh, in the seminar. But of course, I provide further justifications uh, as to why uh, KM is coming back in a very strong way with uh, very, very uh, compelling reasons. And uh, not only KM, but innovation and also the, uh, the intelligent use of the cloud are also very important elements that uh, we can capitalize on. Among all these uh, opportunities, of course, there are challenges as well. And uh, I've done a bit of research in this particular area. I'm more than happy to share with you. What are some of the things that we need to be cautious about in moving forward uh, with KM? Not just uh, spending more and more efforts, but we need to know where to spend, how to spend, and how to link up other opportunities in order to multiply the gain. Now, uh, there will be two surprises in uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, first one is, uh, you know, I'm going to present inside a metaverse, uh, whatever that is. Uh, you will see part of me and uh, part of the uh, presentation material in there. That's the first surprise. And for those of you who stay towards the end of the presentation, there's a second surprise, which you can actually go inside the metaverse and check out the rest of the space in a three-dimensional way without wearing any equipment at all, all right? So here you go. To, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, to, to technology hangs together. And here we go. So I'm uh, let go in my uh, face and uh, what you're seeing here is Seeing here supposed to be a, um, a seemingly three-dimensional virtual space with a hanging, uh, you know, the, a screen of the PowerPoint in there. Can someone confirm that that is the case? Nobody said anything. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Yeah, we, we can, can see zoom, it. All right, wonderful. Closer. So uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to spend. Uh, any time on this, uh, but just to uh, show you around that uh, it is a three-dimensional space. I have uh, hang in uh, different uh, places, different heights, uh, some of the key slides that uh, I'll be using uh, tonight. So uh, later on, when you come into this space, if you feel like it, you can, uh, you know, just rock around, uh, uh, walk around, not rock around, and check out those, some of those slides. Uh, some of those are pictures, some of those are PowerPoint, uh, and uh, as you like, uh, you can also, uh, you know, uh, uh, revisit some of the things that we're talk talking about. All right, so uh, let me see if I can uh, make that uh, a more pleasant uh, viewing angle. I hope that this is okay. It's surely large enough. Uh, all right, so uh, you know the the, the title. It's um, it's quite long, and in fact, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, one thing that troubles me is uh, in this title, there are a number of. Uh, uh, key terms in there, which obviously, um, you know, are, you know, to covering too wide a, a, a spectrum that uh, we want to cover. But be that as it may, I find that, as Les pointed out, uh, with the advancement of technology and uh, other fields, uh, in the past, I've been uh, very, very much concentrated on KM and KM only. Now, that's um, absolutely right. Uh, but in the last few years, I have been given the opportunity uh, to uh, learn more uh, a bit outside KM into industry 4.0, into big data. I mean, you know, deep down I'm an IT man, uh, but uh, you know, I'm not in not a manufacturing uh, guy. And uh, industry 4.0 is, uh, despite all the bells and whistles and uh, IT technologies, uh, uh, many things are still new to me. And I find that uh, branching out to know more about uh, the fourth industrial revolution and big data actually uh, helped me to uh, compose better insights into uh, what uh, some of the things that I've been, uh, you know, uh, resting about, and in particular, I find that, uh, you know, to, uh, some by summarizing my my thoughts after learning some of these uh, uh, new things, uh, you know, to, I'd be able to develop to more compelling reasons why knowledge and innovations are absolutely important for us to, uh, to succeed as an individual, as a team, as an organization, as a country, as a society. You know, to, uh, of course, for many organizations. Uh, especially those uh, smart and uh, fast action ones, 
you know, the data, new sources of data, new volumes of data present new opportunities for creating new knowledge. But then uh, we are also led to, you know, a potential uh, uh, contradiction uh, because uh, not all of this new knowledge, uh, you know, it's in sync with what we already know. Sometimes we may have different assumptions. We may be sharing different types of knowledge or sometimes even contradictory to this new volume of knowledge that's derived. So uh, we're in a conundrum how we actually uh, treat this. And uh, our, my seminar will shed some light into this particular area. Of course, you know, uh, with uh, big data industry 4.0, you know, there's always the uh, uh, the same, uh, you know, the competition between the speed of making decisions versus the accuracy, the absolute accuracy of, uh, of, a, uh, of a decision, right? Uh, and uh, time may not be on our side in some cases. So uh, we may have to forego the final, for example, you know, five to 10% of the accuracy in order to make that quick decision. Now, foregoing is one thing. We also find that uh, in making a quick decision, sometimes there's no causal explanation to come with it. And that makes people like myself, you know, people with a science background uh, and uh, people with an engineering background, very uncomfortable because, uh, you know, you can't explain about it. So why would I have to recommend you know, to make that decision, either myself, or to other people. Let's, uh, let's visit that uh, later on. And it's quite obvious now, you know, 20 years into the uh, 21st century that uh, cloud computing has been around for 15, 20 years. And it's very obvious that uh, moving forward, it already is, but it will be even stronger that uh, future KMS, technical KMS will be, you know, the individualized uh, composed knowledge services in the cloud. So uh, uh, intellectuals like uh, us will be uh, composing sharing, assembling, disassembling, orchestrating, trying, and operationalizing knowledge services via the cloud. Right, and with a topic like this, uh, or with a title like this, it's always difficult to find a, um, a entry point into the presentation. But uh, seeing that, uh, you know, the, you already heard me uh, saying that the industry 4.0 is making a big impact and accelerate and exacerbate the uh, impact of uh, knowledge on organizations, then, uh, We'll take these uh, uh, revolutions as an entry point to uh, uh, to this seminar. So I want you to uh, you know to pay attention to this 2.5 minutes introductory video in one of our massive open online course. No, and I'm not asking you to take the course, but I'm asking you to uh, listen and pay attention and uh, try to identify what are the um, you know the, the big things that actually define a new era of industrial revolution because. Uh, you know, it's, uh, from first to the second to the third to the fourth, you know, it's not an incremental improvement. It's more like a disruptive force that, uh, you know, revolutionized one era to the next one. Now, obviously we are at the onset. Uh, some people say onset, some people may, may already be transforming. Some people have actively, uh, you know, just transformed the organization, but uh, whatever that is, be that as it may, you know, uh, we are at the fourth industrial revolution. That means, you know, that we came from the third end. That also means that uh, we should pay attention in particular, what is defined as in the third industrial revolution and what is, you know, really the compelling things, the interesting things, the wow things in the fourth industrial revolution. Modern society has gone through three major eras of industrial revolution. Driven by the invention of steam and water power, the first industrial revolution took place in the early 19th century. However, work in all industries was still highly labor intensive. The wide application of electrical technology hailed the second industrial revolution in the late 19th century, when manufacturing plants were built, laying out the infrastructure and processes for the mass production of products. Digitalization in the 20th century gave birth to the third industrial revolution. Computational and data analysis technologies ensured consistent and efficient operation of processes. And machines could acquire a very basic form of intelligence to support decision making. With the advancement of big data, cloud computing, data collection and transmission devices, software and increasingly connected societies, we have stepped into the fourth industrial revolution, or Industry 4.0 and it is symbolized by the real-time smartness exhibited by machines. So what exactly is the fourth industrial revolution? What's it like living in a world of the Internet of Things? Just how smart can machines be? 
Will robots take over our jobs? How can organizations and individuals be best prepared for the onset of this disruptive force? This online course covers these fascinating topics and more. It is truly an eye-opener into smart products and services for future living. In a factory, such smartness can be manifested as the intelligent diversion and automation of processes, cyber-physical systems for enhanced modeling to support product design, and operations planning. A smart product can even predict its own potential breakdown and thus alert the user to carry out preventative maintenance to avoid unexpected breakdowns. Massive personalization of products and services is now very real. Our cities are becoming more and more connected and smarter. The division of work between machines and humans is constantly becoming blurred and is being redefined. We can see this happening in the manufacturing, transportation, healthcare, logistics and many other industries. Welcome to the world of Industry 4.0. Wow. So uh, in your reflections, uh, you know, what is uh, the, uh, uh, the one important thing, the most important thing actually underpinning the drive into the fourth industrial revolution that uh, causes all these uh, amazing and wonderful things uh, uh, to, uh, to occur? What do you think? Is that computers? Well, I have to say no, because computers are already included in the third industrial revolution. What about automation? Again, automation is, um, you know, it's already uh, invented and applied extensively in the third industrial revolution. You know, many of the things that you see there, you know, customization, massive personalization of, uh, of products and services, uh, predictive maintenance, and many other things that's uh, said in the video, including smart living. They are because they are there because of the, as less has fallen out, because of the newfound data. You know, the huge volume of data that's being uh, collected, the huge volume of traffic of data that's coming through, our ability to make use uh, of the analysis of the data, the right volume of data, I should say, uh, to derive you know, meaningful uh, conclusions or recommendations for machines to further automate, to make intelligent decisions. You know, these are the things that are driving the wow effect in the fourth industrial revolution. So it's data with algorithm generating the smart, smart in different places, you know, the smart in the local area, smart across the entire you know, the production plant, the smart across uh, you know, the different uh, rooms in the building and so forth. So uh, along with this, uh, you know, the excitement and success or partial success, there are, of course, uh, you know, the challenges. And these are significant challenges. We are facing a, uh, a huge uh, exponential growth in the amount of data. The data are not just, uh, you know, the plain data. They are highly unstructured. And the unstructured to structure ratio is still about 80 to 20%. That means, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, every... Uh, piece of structured information, there are at least four to five times of that uh, also existing. And it's coming at a speed at volume that uh, we can never ever to, uh, uh, to, uh, to absorb, you know. Uh, so not only that, but the modalities of the data and the, uh, you know, the sequence of the data that is coming through are highly unpredictable and highly diversified. So uh, all these hugely complicated the problem for, uh, you know, to analyzing the data. But still, this is where the opportunity is or these are the opportunities in the 21st uh, century uh, it is quite obvious now with two decades into it you know the, the world is increasingly uh, digitalized the world is increasingly increasingly connected uh, by uh, you know the, the dots and the arts uh, the notes and the arts right the notes can be as you know computing equipment resources um documents data uh, uh networks uh, it can also be people it can also be uh, people networks, it can also be trust among people. It can also be links between people and software. You know, for example, if you are creating an account in a social networking website, you are in essence creating a link between yourself, your good self, a human being with software that is installed in the cloud. So, you know, the external networks stored in, uh, in the cloud are very, very powerful. They are a huge repository, hugely connected networks of uh, repositories of knowledge. Well, that depends on how we make use of it, of course. Uh, so the challenge uh, remains, you know, uh, we have access to a lot of data. We still need more. We need, we need to know what sort of data we want and uh, what uh, volume of data, which part of the data we should analyze 
and we need to do it at the, at a rate that is fast enough so that uh, it produces meaningful and useful result in a time frame where the opportunity exists. If that's uh, not enough uh, challenges presented, well, think about it again. Yet, for those who make success, you know, they are precisely the people who came up with the algorithms or use existing algorithms with modifications to satisfy some of the constraints, some of all the constraints that are just mentioned and manifest that to, uh, to yield smart systems, products, parts, uh, and, uh, and tools. Well, coming back to organizations, I think uh, you know, we all agree that organizations generate and, um, uh, you know, to, uh, and be exposed to a lot of data, information, and knowledge. But uh, you know, to, uh, we don't seem to do well in terms of uh, you know, keeping uh, good accounts of the data and the knowledge that we have. You know, to look at this, uh, you know, to, uh, organizations employ people, and uh, people will come to work every day or work from home. Doesn't matter, you know, to, uh, they have meetings, they have uh, a lot of tacit knowledge exchange through conversations. Much of that is not uh, analyzed or captured. You know, they generate documents, all right. Well, some uh, knowledge is being externalized, but never enough because the context, uh, it remains very difficult uh, to be uh, codified, right? So when you, uh, you know, to extend that to other activities, there's a huge uh, a plethora of, uh, of uh, information that is not properly captured and uh, let alone being turned into knowledge. And that's only internal. What about external? Equally, if not more, an organization exposed to a lot of externally uh, exist information. Now, some of that may not be useful. A lot of that may not be relevant at all, but it also means that some of that can be quite relevant and uh, can be readily, even readily accessible in a public domain. Of course, you know, it's a, a large part of that uh, could be uh, confidential or may not be accessible to the organization, but only if the organization knows how to look for such knowledge, know where to look for it with the right tools, still, you know, it's, uh, we can, con we can, uh, can confer that uh, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of gain the organization can, uh, can make. In fact, research has proven that uh, those organizations, you know, uh, who are uh, intelligent enough to articulate, to find, articulate, assimilate external knowledge, external knowledge and networks into their internal knowledge structures are the winning organization. And that's uh, proven based on research results already. In fact, there's a term called absorptive capacity which is a measurement, a metric used to uh, gauge how effective an organization is in linking up, absorbing, soaking up external knowledge, you know, in a systematic way, in a way that is well articulated with the existing knowledge, existing body of knowledge uh, in the organization, not just individual, but collective knowledge, and be able to use this, uh, you know, soak up knowledge to uh, generate new values. And that would be wonderful for those organizations who can uh, achieve that. Well, what about management theories? Yeah, what about management theories? They are behind, you know, a lot of the theories are behind. At least up to about 50 years ago, uh, uh, many uh, theorists or theoreticians are still talking about uh, the theory of the firm. The theory of the firm, it's an outdated concept and uh, we shouldn't be talking about it, but just for historical uh, sake, that it was so naive to assume that organizations, uh, you know, to only need to hang on to a set of processes. You know, to knowing a set of processes would would uh, be able to produce what the organization is set out to produce. Now, we all know how naive that is because uh, people, uh, you know, it's a skill cannot be easily replaced. You know, it's, uh, someone uh, quit, someone left, you know, it's not uh, uh, easy as uh, go out on the street and pick another person, give him uh, one, one or two days training and be able to repeat exactly the same uh, uh, competencies and productivity as the previous person. So far from it. Well, so other theories have, have uh, invented, for example, the resource-based view of the firm has been a company site. That's about, uh, uh, you know, uh, most managers or directors would try to make, uh, you know, uh, a combination of the resources that uh, organization possess in order to pursue after the, uh, uh, the uh, opportunities uh, in front of them. Uh, sometimes uh, those intelligent ones would even able to make use of the existing resource to create new opportunities. And in the last uh, 15 years, 20 years, you know, um, theories have moved on, getting closer to the real world's needs. And that is, uh, you know, the, uh, the knowledge-based view of the firm, you know, and I'm sure you heard about, you heard about it, knowledge-based intensive activities. So, uh, you know, so finally, uh, we realize that, uh, uh, you know, the people are important, people's brain is most important. So uh, 
if we can uh, breed a loyal workforce, if we can breed a group of uh, people who are very, uh, you know, contributory and uh, have nice ideas, it's wonderful because you can have a uh, infinite fountain of ideas and infinitely renewable resource in the organization. And that sounds just too good to be true. Well, uh, Peter, as it may, the organization have been responding. Uh, surely organization realized that uh, there's a big gap in the loss of knowledge. There's a big gap in uh, trying to uh, retain and uh, transfer knowledge. So uh, various ways have been applied quite commonly, quite extensively uh, over the years, and they are still being applied. For example, uh, you know, documenting what you, you said, uh, having a, uh, you know, a set of uh, exit interviews to try to recover what this person uh, you know, truly knows uh, mentoring scheme, uh, quite an expensive one and uh, uh, requires a lot of effort and care, uh, although it is effective. Uh, and uh, when uh, nearly all is lost, I've been through that before. I don't want to go back to that uh, that way, which is the last one. You know, uh, when uh, nobody knows uh, why this is being done, uh, then you may have to go to check one of your, uh, uh, you know, legacy systems and see how the logic is being coded up and it's a very painful way, and uh, even what you recover there uh, probably is too brittle to be uh, to be reinterpreted as uh, what you should follow. So uh, uh, anyway, there's no universal, uh, you know, best practice in trying to uh, reduce the gap. There's still a very actively researched the topic. So there are still, you know, lots of knowledge uh, blockages and uh, leakages within the organization and also among organizations. Now, not to uh, not to distract you, but uh, I'll remind you again. Uh, next month, uh, I'll be uh, co-delivering a talk with uh, Dr. Liu Gang from Shenzhen University, and uh, we'll be uh, delivering uh, uh, under the uh, species of the uh, European uh, Mentoring and Coaching uh, uh, Council on a topic called retention and transfer of tacit knowledge challenges and case studies. All right. So, as I said, you know, it's becoming increasingly compelling, uh, compelling for knowledge to be uh, properly managed, harnessed, and, uh, and, and actively uh, you know, to, uh, grown and applied in order for organization to uh, generate the next big thing, the new advantage. Now to answer the rest of the, uh, to shed light on the rest of the issues and a question that I put up on the, the second slide, we're gonna go through some of the key topics uh, in the rest of the seminar. Firstly, you know, to, we take the, a perspective of knowledge, there are different perspectives that we can, uh, you know, to, uh, we can put on knowledge and uh, on a seminar like this with a one hour duration on so many topics to uh, to cover, which uh, never will have enough time to do. I'll take the easy way out and uh, take on this perspective of the tacit explicit knowledge. And I want you to once again to, uh, pay attention to this short video. Uh, there's only an audio sound. There's no conversation and. Uh, you know, so we can briefly discuss about uh, uh, what's being, um, uh, you know, communicated in this video. What do you think? I think uh, that video has vividly, you know, to illustrate the importance of tacit knowledge, you know, the, the tacit explicit knowledge dimension. We're taking this perspective uh, uh, into uh, 
uh, you know, the types of knowledge here. So uh, tested knowledge is about uh, things that we know uh, that, um, you know, sometimes we know, so sometimes we don't know that we actually know. So uh, I'm sure you have seen this analogy in uh, textbooks and in other presentations before, you know, using the iceberg and a, uh, and a ship, you know, the, with the uh, uh, water line to illustrate the differentiation between tacit and explicit knowledge. What you can see visibly about the uh, sea line is generally uh, only the explicit knowledge. Now, if that's the case, then uh, common sense tells us that, uh, you know, the tacit knowledge probably will be uh, quite a few times, you know, to, uh, un submerged underneath the water. And um, it's, um, it's much, much bigger and uh, um, in more depth than the explicit knowledge. Now, nobody dares to put any, uh, you know, to estimate on to quantifying these things. Uh, it's uh, all uh, too uh, hard to be uh, quantified. But, uh, you know, to, in general, we can assume that, uh, or we can uh, say that uh, tested knowledge uh, is a uh, untapped uh, reservoir of knowledge that, um, that can never be fully, uh, you know, to, uh, revealed or externalized. So, uh, that means that no matter how much effort you put in, in order to codify, uh, you know, what have you, uh, uh, no matter how how willing the person is, no matter how much time and effort and resources put in, there's never ever to be uh, externalizing everything. So uh, you know, as the man uh, in the previous video show, uh, the old man, the retired engineer, you know, the knocking effort is only two dollars, but knowing where to knock. That is where the tested knowledge and the experience, uh, you know, uh, tells you. Well, more to this, uh, in fact, the, uh, you know, the, the seriousness of the tested explicit knowledge uh, is, uh, is a lot more, you know, to, uh, everyone has heard about, uh, we know a lot more than what we can say, and we can say a lot more than we can write. So there's already blockage or leakages from our brain to our head, right? And everybody knows, of course, even if you're presented with the same, you know, the written piece of knowledge, our interpretation would be a very different. Why? Because knowledge requires a context, right? So that context uh, helps to uh, piece together uh, other things that are not uh, ex ex uh, you know, explicitly uh, uh, stated. And everyone uh, have a context by, uh, you know, when reviewing something, the context is very much uh, represented by the surroundings by the environment, your own experience, your previous encounter, and by other uh, measures. So, uh, you know, to almost guarantee that uh, when the same piece of information is presented to uh, different people, uh, their internal interpretation uh, is, uh, is different. Well, what we do know is, uh, you know, we can back to the old uh, uh, basics, which uh, conversations are very valuable. You know, we love to have conversations, uh, you know, uh, before the start of the seminar, to, uh, we have to uh, call it a stop because uh, we love to talk and uh, people love to talk. Uh, conversations uh, help to reveal and exchange a lot of tested knowledge uh, in a natural way. Let me say a few more words about, uh, you know, so why is that the knowledge advantage? Why the knowledge advantage is so important, you know, to, uh, when, to, uh, when you also take into account about the advancement of the fourth industrial revolution and big data. Well, to understand that, I believe that we have to go and uh, revisit the value propositions that most firms, most firms operate on. And even today, you know, I have to say that uh, these traditional value propositions still exist. And what are they? Well, that's basically uh, easy to understand. If you want to start a business, if you want to start a profitable, to a successful business, you first need to know about, you know, what's out there in the market that people want, right? So. Uh, you have a good uh, grasp of what the market, uh, the market needs. You have a good grasp about uh, your capability or your firm's capability to uh, generate whatever that is, that uh, product service or product and service, right? And then uh, you uh, also be able to identify the potential customers accurately, uh, correctly, and be able to reach out to them, reach out to them for marketing, convince them that uh, your product or service is a good one, and be able to satisfy them by, uh, you know, uh, shipping uh, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, transmitting whatever you are providing to them successfully and easily to make it easy to do business with, right? So with all that, um, common sense um, tell us that, uh, you know, you get, uh, you get return, typically in terms of uh, monetary return, but could be other things. So that's uh, 
that closes the cycle of the uh, value creation. Now that uh, has worked for many, many decades. Uh, today, I don't think that is enough, but let's lock into an argument. Let's not lock into an argument at this stage and just, uh, uh, you know, just considering these uh, basic, uh, uh, you know, value propositions for firms to uh, achieve success. Under these uh, uh, three, um, you know, the value disciplines, um, well, under this, uh, you know, the, uh, method of uh, competition, uh, there are three value disciplines, okay? The first one is, I'm sure you've heard about them. The first one is, uh, you know, the product and service leadership. You know, when you know what the market wants, uh, you have to be uh, good at, you know, the producing what the market uh, needs, um, pretty good and pretty close to what they need, right? Whatever is product and all services. Second one is uh, operational excellence, right? And that is producing what, uh, what you promised, what the market needs, what the customer wants in an effective, consistent quality and economical and high production manner, right? So, uh, you know, the fire up your process engine, your manufacturing plant and make it consistent, make it high uptime and make it generate, uh, you know, the, the same product uh, that uh, your customer wants. Uh, with quality, consistency, and uh, all the rest of it. The third one is uh, customer intimacy. I make the uh, the hero smaller because typically, I believe that this is the, the 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 most difficult one among the three to achieve because this requires, you know, uh, theoretically speaking and uh, in detail, uh, massive personal customization, right, or personalization. So, uh, ideally speaking, you should know every one of your customers what he or she wants. And ideally speaking, like in the video, remember the garments, individual garments, you uh, have to spray that, uh, you know, with all the uh, patterns, the, the color, uh, um, the style that your customer wants. And the worst come to the worst, or I shouldn't use this term, I may say that to the extreme, you know, your customer may only need one piece, right? And your customization, you need to attend that. That would be the extreme, right? So most firms, uh, put it this way, um, it is my belief in reading management book and successful companies, nearly all firms cannot excel in all the three, right? If your firm or any firm can excel in uh, two of these, uh, two out of three, uh, that should be very good already, right? So uh, uh, because uh, there's always competing resources that you need to put in in order to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be excel at three. And, you know, everybody knows the same rule. Uh, no firm would have uh, unlimited resources. All right? So in your mind, I'm not sure, you know, to, uh, what do you think if in, in Asia, in this part of the world, you know, to, uh, if um, there's room for improvement, there's room to improve, you know, which would be the more common way for Asian uh, organizations to, uh, to, to tackle? I would say, no, this one, operational excellence. Right, and uh, that has been drummed into our head. Uh, make it cheap, make it fast, make it productive, and make it uh, economical. Because in Asia, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, we got the we got the volume, we got the demand. You know, uh, so if you generate more at lower cost, you definitely will win. Because uh, you know, uh, uh, you you can uh, you can fulfill the market and European American market at least for the last. Uh, uh, 50, 60 years or even longer, you know, they can, cannot compete based on price. They can compete based on quality, but they can may not be compete or they cannot compete based on price. So, you know, it's um, a revisit to the industrial revolutions as mentioned in the video, right? So we are now in the fourth, you know, um, technically speaking, and the fourth also means that we came from the third. So have read about these words, efficiency, productivity, Cost optimization, low balancing, and uh, blah blah blah. All these words are, you know, are very much emphasis and to operationalize and strictly adhere to and strong governance in the third industrial revolution because these are the basics, you know, for success or governing success in the third industrial revolution. And in fact, uh, you know, at that time, uh, even the uh, uh, training of people. Uh, you know, to, uh, very, very specialized, you know, that you're trained to perform a particular role. If you work in a, uh, in a factory, in the conveyor belt area, this is your part. And uh, you are trained to handle this repetitively with speed, with accuracy, with consistency. You are being measured by how many times, you know, to, uh, you have done this uh, successfully. You are being penalized for how many times that you have made a mistake 
in certain areas which you're not supposed to. Well, you think that that's only restricted to the factory plant? No, in fact, uh, you know, the whole uh, society, I would say, uh, if you go to organization, organizational design is much the same. You know, we have uh, hierarchies, uh, putting managers, uh, um, uh, junior managers, middle level managers, senior managers in various hierarchies. And, uh, you know, to each uh, division or unit specialized in the things that they're supposed to do. You know, they are, you know, processes governing around it and they are managers and uh, systems to uh, strictly enforce, you know, the smooth operations, supposedly smooth operation within that particular unit. Why? Because, um, you know, the, 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 um, the theory is uh, job standardization is good. You know, we can move faster if, um, you know, we concentrate the work in a particular unit. We can move faster if people are specially trained to, uh, uh, to look after the particular area, if we have the data, to support it. So the whole uh, hierarchy uh, for a business unit very much is being set up for, uh, you know, to, for optimization, for uh, minimization of uh, cost, uh, for concentration of expertise, and very important for control. Again, you know, to, you have people who are trained specifically to handle to certain types of decisions, to govern certain types of workers in a particular, you know, to part of the, uh, of the workforce. Was well, that any good? Well, it may be good in terms of uh, producing that particular part within the process, right? But overall speaking, it's not good in a knowledge-based society. Why? Because, uh, you know, looking at these pipes, I'm not sure about you, would uh, help me to, uh, uh, to, to, to remind me to think about uh, silos, you know, silos. You know, it's a, a business unit is like a pipe. You know, within the pipe, uh, the paperwork, the information, the data, the knowledge, uh, Although not perfectly uh, flow, but uh, still uh, quite uh, quite smooth. You know, everyone uh, pretty much know who are the people in that unit, unless it's a huge organization or too big. Otherwise, uh, you have good knowledge about uh, who else is also in your unit, uh, who is competent in what, and things like that. But uh, across units, no. You know, um, oh, that's in a different department. Yeah, I don't know anything about that department. So um, that is no good in a knowledge-based society because. Uh, you know, to reinvent the wheel, not uh, learning about what other organizations have uh, have uh, committed as a mistakes, uh, and not sharing enough uh, waste of time and all these things. You know, add to uh, the inefficiency and also the uh, uh, the lack of uh, you know innovative ideas and thoughts amongst workers in the organization. So all in all, you know, this kind of uh, all organizational design favors task specialization, control, and efficiency but it inhibits the cross flow of knowledge between units, division and innovation. If you work in a core center you know, the area, then uh, you only have to ask uh, yourself, you know, does your organization measure you know, the core center representatives by, by what? By the number of calls that they have uh, answered today, by the average time that they have resolved the call, you know, and uh, by the, uh, the, the number of times uh, a call has to be escalated. If you have uh, yes to uh, one or more of these questions, then um, it's um, you know it's, it's serious to think that uh, you know this organization is still very much trapped in terms of measurement in the uh, in the third industrial era. It's not uh, in the fourth industrial era because in the fourth industrial era you will reward people spending more time you know to rubbing shoulders with the uh, customers, learning about what customers need, learning about the market, you know, inspiring the other. Uh, workers to think about what would be good, the next big uh, product and you know, services for your customers. You can't do that by answering a call quickly and putting the phone down just to get the numbers on the board. So, you know, I don't think, think I need to repeat that. Uh, I'm led to believe that most of the people in the audience are actually, uh, you know, to, uh, KM to converted or seriously interested in uh, knowledge management. So uh, you should uh, have, uh, you know, 10 times the list as I put out on this page here, you know, or they doesn't know what they know. Uh, they um, they fail to assess critical knowledge, let alone to trying to protect or harness it, right? Uh, spending an awful amount of time looking for thinking, uh, looking for something, yet uh, you know to, uh, couldn't uh, couldn't find it, and uh, not knowing who uh, who knows uh, you know a uh, particular area well, so they cannot find experts in the organization as well. Well, again, if I can, uh, you know, to, uh, further stimulate your thoughts and reinforce what I've been saying, you know, to, uh, 
much of the design, organizational design, the measurement metrics is still very much stuck in the, or today's organization is still very much stuck in the third industrial revolution, right? Those companies who have break, broken out of this mode and be able to measure and stimulate stuff in terms of innovative new ideas, flat organizations, you know, the, they, uh, they will search ahead. It's very true, you know, the knowledge and innovation the, from the fourth industrial revolution onwards holds a key, holds the key to stimulate success. Well, there are other reasons supporting it as well. Uh, you know, the ICT tools has been becoming more and more uh, 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 available, available in advance, it's easy to lay your hands on it. You know, the organization becoming less hierarchical, that means more people can voice their opinion, they can share and uh, more people would have a say or can have a say about uh, what their idea is. So that's wonderful. It's more end-to-end -end, uh, communications rather than one-to-end, one-sided communication. And then uh, there's also uh, globalization, which uh, combined with the advancement of the digital society, you know, bringing the, uh, you know, the, uh, people closer, bringing companies closer uh, between their uh, office and their customers and bringing, the, you know, teams of expertise you know, it's uh, only a few clicks away on the internet. So uh, this is all wonderful and uh, we should not be underestimating these opportunities. We should be uh, leveraging on all these opportunities and then uh, putting our heads together, you know, to, uh, uh, as a term, you know, to brainstorm about what new values and uh, uh, um, that we can create for the market. So in the old days, uh, we have been using data, you know, the information as, uh, as uh, you know, the checkpoints to verify whether we're doing the right thing or not. Uh, we have been sharing knowledge to make sure that things are being consistently performed. When we move forward, uh, we get a lot of uh, data uh, written down, checked it uh, in order to benchmark uh, performance to make sure that uh, we are performing as good as before uh, with uh, continuous improvement but that is not going to be enough empowering us to success in the fourth industrial revolution. We must be adding smarts, you know, to, in to new areas. We must be, uh, um, you know, to collecting our, our wisdom together to brainstorm new uh, ideas, new products and services, and redefine the values that's being generated to our customers, leading them to new and superior, superior customer experience. And I think KM has a lot to offer in here. Well, I mean, the theory is if you are switched on, your organization is switched on to adopt uh, the KM journey, you start to define your strategy, align it with your uh, organization's pledge, goals, and mission. You define your knowledge processes, you train up your people, or you, know, to, uh, you, uh, you put together a KM office uh, to uh, pursue these uh, these programs and initiatives in a coordinated fashion. And then uh, ultimately, if things are going the right way, you know, to, uh, gradually, I wouldn't say that it's happening overnight, you know, to, uh, organization to, uh, or lift in organization performance starting to come through. And that performance, maybe in terms of creativity, maybe in terms of productivity, maybe in terms of monetary gain or a combination of these, and maybe in terms of uh, relationship capital as well. So, you know, the, the sweet taste of success, uh, I need mean, to read this to you. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, to hopefully can enjoy to, um, some part of this, uh, but increasingly obvious that uh, in order to uh, taste this uh, sweet uh, taste of success, we would have to expand our KM effort to reach out to external networks, to external networks. Remember, you know, the networks outside of our organization, outside of our personal circles, you know, these networks contain, uh, once again, uh, people, uh, trust, uh, uh, people networks, uh, data, information, uh, computing resources, and other types of goodies in there. We must find ways to assess, uh, you know, the perceived the usefulness of uh, these networks, build trust, so that they becoming, uh, you know, part of the dynamic capabilities that uh, we and our organizations can uh, draw on uh, to create opportunities and to create and to pursue, you know, to open up opportunities. Well, a bit more about uh, the uh, knowledge um, uh, generated in organization and also their leakages. Well, you can see this uh, diagram about people. 
repositories and uh, organizational units in the organization. Let's start with people on the left hand side. You know, the organizations require people. Fair enough. And people, uh, you know, to, uh, 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 form project teams, you know, to, um, and depending on the size and the top of the projects, they discuss among themselves, they produce output and so forth. There's already a lot of leakages uh, already. Why? Because not everything, not everything is written down or documented or permitted in the business process. So, uh, you know, the projects will get the deliverables, uh, projects may get important reports as a spin-off, but uh, you, you may assume that uh, Apart from minutes, uh, then much of what's being discussed and uh, communicated uh, is not uh, documented. All right, well, the typical KM approach would have a repository uh, and have communities as well. So repository may retain some of the uh, tacit to explicit uh, uh, codified knowledge, but uh, remember what uh, we discussed before, context is very important. This is in fact a very weak method because context is never documented and documented sufficiently and therefore, uh, codified assets uh, uh, will render to be ineffective or obsolete very quickly, okay? Uh, be that as it may, even if you put it in the repository, uh, there are also gaps in implementation. You know, the metadata is not uh, being uh, properly uh, identified or configured. Uh, taxonomy is not uh, uh, properly understood. Uh, and therefore, you know, the misclassifications and other uh, problems will lead to um, uh, despite an asset exists, but it was not found or very difficult to be found. So uh, uh, no good frustrations and a waste of time as well. Then we look at uh, on the right hand side, uh, organizations don't exist in isolation. Organizations uh, sure have their own hierarchy, no matter how complicated or how simple it is. There is a flow of knowledge, but there's also blockages. Remember the silos and also the, uh, the leakages uh, among them. Uh, but organizations also, to, you know, to, uh, communicate and partner or form alliances with other organizations. There's inter, supposedly inter-organizational knowledge flow as well. And, uh, you know, I don't see the behavior is any different from other parts that we have described. So again, there are, you know, knowledge blockages and leakages in there. So uh, when you look at all this, it's really a big waste. There was so much, uh, you know, knowledge or useful knowledge that is not uh, retained. and uh, even worse than that, there's no attempts or, or you know, uh, consciousness about uh, why and how these things are being uh, leaked out and not uh, being uh, uh, harnessed in a properly uh, systematic way. So we need to manage knowledge to what? To try to reduce the leakage of tacit knowledge, to try to enable the flow of knowledge across silos and organizations. And now these two are more like remedial measures but the third one, uh, which I am particularly keen on, is you know the accelerator, the opportunity to create opportunities, right, mm -hmm. for sparking innovations in the age of digitalization. Right, that you have to take an outside view uh, from a firm in order to appreciate the power of that uh, of that uh, tapping into that external network or networks. Let me uh, say a. Few quick words about uh, industry 4.0. Now, uh, obviously, this uh, you know not the right place to go anything detailed into it. Uh, industry 4.0 to me, it's a uh, you know it's a way to put together you know business applications uh, based on the business models that draw from the use of various technologies. Now, the exciting point to me in industry 4.0 are these five things. I'm not sure whether you agree. First one I mentioned before, and first one then foremost is the data. The new farm data, the huge volume of data that's being uh, collected. Second one are the algorithms, the algorithms that we put the data to work, right? And these algorithms could be existing even decade old algorithm, but it's still generating excitement. Why? Because we have never had data from those sources before, right? So uh, with all respect to artificial intelligence, that's where I get my PhD 35 years ago. And, uh, you know, I think AI has has uh, advanced that steadily, but not uh, in a big scale. If you look at uh, uh, the advancement of ICT in the last uh, 50 or 60 years, still, I believe the breakthrough consistently is in hardware, not in software, right? So even the fundamental algorithms that has been invented many, many years ago, now with a huge uh, volume of data coming through from areas that never expect to see that before, it can create a lot of, of uh, excitement, of course. You know, it's not as simple as that. Uh, the algorithm needs to be uh, 
further refine and improve uh, and uh, be able to scale up to handle the, the volume and the speed, right? And then there's integration, you know, you mean uh, now for the first time, we see a lot more data can be accessed. Well, what does that mean? That allows more sophisticated decisions to be made, to be made by human, to be made by human uh, uh, machine cooperative decision-making, to be made by computer algorithms, right? Once again, that creates the wow, because uh, previously we were always, uh, you know, needed to make that decision with human intuition. Now, with more data being collected from more dimensions, for the first time, uh, you know, it's a, a small group of decisions that previously determined to be too complicated for uh, machines to handle is now, you know, to, uh, capable uh, for machines to be analyzed and even make the fundamental judgment, if so allowed by human beings. That's the automation uh, challenge. We see new automations, non-existing uh, efficiency automations, but new automations in previous uh, you know, to processes in previous places where processes would not expect uh, uh, machines to, uh, to automate. And of course, all these are happening in real time. So I would say that uh, Industry 4.0 is bringing out uh, these five, uh, you know, to wow effects. Now you don't need all the five in order to generate a big wow, you know, to think about with data and then combine with uh, in one of those circles. Think, for example, you have data, you have algorithms, you have integration, you can, you know, to, uh, spin off a wow effect uh, uh, application, a new found uh, value gain uh, for, for, for society and for organizations, you know, brainstorm about this. So the challenge uh, to us is, uh, you know, look at this. Didn't we see this sentence before? Yes. We saw it after the video. I use that to uh, highlight the importance of the data. So it looks like almost a perfect match you know, to uh, what Industry 4.0 is offering as an opportunity for all of us. So, you know, the, moving forward, the challenge for us is to how to make use of these, uh, you know, the, um, 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 exciting points or exciting achievements uh, to generate new customer experience in, the, in fundamentally, uh, you know, the, a new value change that we have never heard before or never imagined, never realized before. That's where I believe the opportunities are. Of course, you know, the people in the factory, the experienced one is already leveraging on this. They are, you know, deploying the IOTs, uh, uh, sensors to many places so that uh, their equipment can have, can feedback more data for central systems to analyze. They can do early predictive maintenance. They can do more benchmarking. They can have early detection of potential faulty uh, uh, product uh, so that uh, the wastage is significantly reduced. And the uh, you know the production time is also the significantly shortened. Similar in other uh, manufacturing plants as well. So if you look at uh, this diagram just to uh, uh, get you uh, get you uh, you know to, uh, excited about uh, you know if you can uh, fit uh, a sensor to uh, car tires, what happened, right? So the the sensors in the in the tires can report back to a central system. Typically, it's in the cloud. But anyway, this central system can uh, real time analyze, you know, what are the signals coming through and uh, how to uh, deal with them. So with that, you know, uh, you can see that uh, if you uh, study more, you can come up with algorithms or apply algorithms to measure if uh, there is any uh, abnormalities across the data that's being received. Uh, the data may be from uh, different, uh, uh, you know, trucks and different vehicles. So you can group them and look at uh, trucks and vehicles of the same type, same make same model, similar wear and tear, and identify the abnormalities, right? So you're starting to be able to do some predictive uh, measurement, which is wonderful because uh, this will save life, not only save cost. So think further about this uh, from different perspectives, you know, the, from a driver's perspective, from a car owner's perspective, from a fleet operator's perspective, from a manufacturer perspective, from a tire maker's perspective, and everyone has, uh, has uh, things to gain, you know, to, uh, once this additional data is coming through, it's already happening. And UPS is a good example. That several years ago, they have already reported that uh, with their 2000 vehicles deployed across America, they are doing precisely what I described earlier to analyze the, uh, the path uh, that uh, certain uh, delivery trucks take and see if they wear and tear across those roads uh, systematically, routinely across a few months 
does generate higher wear and tear on the tires compared to other vehicles traveling on different routes. And they can extend that, that analysis to drivers as well. Okay, I'm uh, on the finishing the, uh, path. So I just want to point out uh, the importance of uh, the cloud. So very quickly, and my view is uh, even with uh, the, uh, the, the applications that I've just pointed out earlier, most of the applications on industry 4.0 up to now, they are really, people are still really trying to solve the problems in the third industrial revolution. Efficiency, uh, reduction in uh, cost, and also optimization, right? So uh, very few of them actually generate a whole new ground for generating uh, value uh, creation in new business model. And let me remind everybody again, we are into the third, sorry, the fourth industrial revolution, 20 years or more, 30 years and more uh, into the, uh, uh, into the 21st uh, century. And uh, it's uh, writing on the wall. We are surrounded by highly connected information. ICT tools are becoming more and more uh, 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 prevalent and easy to use and powerful, you know, uh, we'd be foolish not to make use of the knowledge. Where are they? The knowledge in the networks, the knowledge in the networks that we can extend to, to tap into, to build with trust in them. So I'm uh, saying that uh, we should shift to, uh, to succeed uh, using the knowledge and innovation. We should extend from uh, mere internal efficiency and external competitions, uh, especially uh, by competing with cost, product, and services, to network building, integration, collaboration, and learning. This is a paradigmatic shift, and many firms are still coming to grips with it. So finally, the cloud. You know, the, to me, the cloud played a very important role because, uh, as I said, advancement in ICT means that uh, you know, using uh, Austin Walters. A business model canvas. If you look at these nine dimensions, it's hard to hard to see any one of these dimensions that is not web enabled or that is not cloud powered, right? So therefore, you know, to increasingly all the things that in these dimensions that the firm relies on, that the firm interacts with, they are in the cloud. They may not be in the same cloud, but they are in the cloud, right? Which which provides uh, accessibility, scalability and also the, uh, lots of tools for analysis and composition. So I'm saying that uh, uh, learning from uh, innovation management and service innovation, adjusting the firm boundaries, this is where KM needs to put more efforts in, helping to understand how to adjusting, how to adjust the firm boundaries, what boundaries, the nine boundaries based on the business model that a firm interacts with, customers, uh, profitability, cost, uh, partnership, uh, channels, and more. Adjusting the firm boundary means that shifting the cost, shifting the work, shifting the ownership, shifting the data, shifting the possession of power and control, or more, or a combination of this. And when you start to, uh, you know, to disturb uh, that uh, boundary, interesting, interesting things happen. And to me, you know, that is the origin of a lot of innovative thoughts. You try that, you know, to, Think about something that uh, you know typically your firms uh, perform, but find a way so that you can flip it over to other firms to do, uh, or uh, ask your customer to do. But equally, it generate excitement and enjoyment for the customer. Like in an air in an airport, uh, hopefully uh, most uh, people's experience are still not uh, too forgetting. You know, the, uh, before the pandemic sets in, the increasingly, you know, the check in is uh, self service right uh, less and less uh, counters for you to check in why you know you would have thought that uh, traditional value proposition you know i pay for the air ticket it's expensive you know so you handle everything for me you know just give me a boarding pass and i can uh, get on you know and start to relax but uh, people are flocking to use the self-service uh, check-in because it's more convenient it's quicker if you wait for the line you know unless you're business class or first class you may have to wait for uh, i don't know i don't know maybe five to ten times of the normal uh, queue that uh, you line up to do, uh, you know, self lodging uh, uh, services uh, check in at the airport. So that's a typical service innovation trick that uh, actually flip over uh, the performance or part of the process from the service provider, the service provider to the customer. So my glimpse of the future uh, is already happening. It's not too much of a distant future. 
you know, X as a service is the future of uh, all KM system, right? Into the future, we look at, uh, you know, it's everything that you do, uh, you'll be able to compose it uh, on, uh, on the cloud and you can orchestrate your own services as well. You, I think now there are apps that allow you to compose your apps and you can decide whether these apps is only being used by you, uh, by your friends or to go public uh, uh, if you so wish to, okay? So uh, X as a service, it's a great way to, uh, to uh, maximize the uh, wisdom of individuals, yet harness the collective power of people. So uh, start to get more practice into it and uh, you shouldn't get the hang of it. As Les said, uh, you know, uh, people are still required because there's still a lot of intuition uh, that uh, merely uh, deriving the knowledge from uh, data, whatever is existing data or new data would not suffice. Okay, so uh, uh, luckily, you know, we are not completely uh, replies yet uh, we still have a role, but we must, you know, to find out what's the best way to work with uh, algorithms and also the robots in order to complement uh, their, uh, you know, the systematic uh, uh, computations and be able to come up with a uh, uh, one plus one, one plus one more than uh, two uh, solutions. Okay, so maybe a reminder for me to finish. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the beginning uh, that uh, there was a second surprise. Um, I would like to ask, uh, you know, Irene, Dr. Fan, to put a link in the um, uh, chat box so that uh, for those of you who would like to venture into the metaverse, uh, you'll be able to see. I was sure you would like to uh, refresh your screen. Okay, I'll do that. You mean the metaverse screen? Yes, on the Zoom sharing. Okay, I'll I'll yeah. first stop the Zoom sharing. Yeah. But everyone else can join the metaverse now. Yeah, if you mm -hmm. can give them the link. It is sent out at the chat box. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sharing the thanks for letting me know. You see that? Mm -hmm. Is the PowerPoint screen back? Yeah. Uh, in the metaverse, yes. Okay. Not um, yeah, but you're not sharing in Zoom now. Ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, I'll show you again. I'm sure. I'm sure you're having meta screens. <laughs> okay. Now, are we back? Yes, it's coming up. Yeah. Well, right, you can uh, if if you uh, look at uh, the screen that I'm sharing uh, on the uh, PowerPoint um, frame. Uh, you can actually go into the metaverse with the link that uh, Dr. Fan has put into the uh, uh, the chat line. And in fact, uh, let me point out to you some basic um, principles for uh, operation. Um, the main keys are these, right? So you use the uh, QWE ASD. I mean, you should get the hang of it. You don't need to remember. Just press a few keys and you see that uh, your avatar start to rotate and the orient itself, right? You can also use the uh, the up arrow and down arrow keys. Now to say, I think to say hello to someone to wave your hand, you press one uh, to, I forgot what two is like, but it's not offensive, so you can press two. <laughs> There's nothing offensive. Uh, if you say yes, you press Y, and to say, to indicate a no, you press an N, all right? So um, go and check it out, and some of the slides that I've used, is in there. Um, I think in terms of uh, seminar, I should stop here. Uh, you should, uh, you should, uh, you can have a 
opportunity to check it out. And uh, even after this uh, Zoom session is uh, concluded, you can still uh, check out and, uh, uh, and read uh, some of the summary slides that I have in there. Now, there is also a, um, a survey that I love to get your input. So I'll ask uh, Dr. Fan to deposit that link into the chat line again. Here is the journey. journey, all right? So there's a, there's a brief survey that uh, I would like to collect uh, your valuable feedback about uh, uh, attending a Metaverse presentation, all right? So uh, that's the second link that uh, Dr. Fan has put into the chat line. So you can uh, provide some input that would be much appreciated. Before I hand it back to uh, Les Hales, I mentioned mm -hmm. about this seminar that uh, I'm giving with Dr. Liu Gan at Shenzhen Technology University. Uh, and uh, stay tuned. If you uh, are connected with me on social channels already, then uh, you will have uh, uh, you will know you will be notified uh, from uh, one of my feed. Okay. Uh, if not, uh, you can contact me later, and we are only happy to uh, to include you in the uh, attendance. All right, uh, Mr. Hales, and back. Okay. Hi, Eric. Can can you hear me? Just raise your hand. I can. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Look, I think we all should give great thanks to Eric today because he's been a wonderful tour guide for us on a number of areas. I think he's refreshed our memory of what some of the original value propositions of knowledge management were all about. And in a way, he also reminded us that perhaps the way organizations have been built around what I'd like to call the Industrial Revolution hasn't necessarily accommodated the use of knowledge management in, in most organizations. And let me just go on. I, I actually see the two revolutions that have gone on. The Industrial Revolution, which was primarily founded on energy. If we look at the Industrial Revolution from steam, coal, etc., oil, gas, the thing that has really revolutionized our lives has been the production of energy and the way it enabled uh, production in factories, roads to be built, air transport, et cetera. But, but what we're doing now is going through another, another revolution and that's the digital revolution or the internet revolution. And that revolution is based around data. And what I'm seeing from Eric's presentation very clearly is that in a new revolution, there are a set of new rules and a lot of the old organizations have not really accommodated the new rules. But as they get to grips with the value of data in their organization, I think that's going to draw along with it the fact the value of knowledge in their organization, and it's going to bring back knowledge management to a center stage as well. So with that, I'd like to thank Eric for the wonderful tour. And just to say, uh, please follow the BAKE uh, uh, projects and organizations, and also what the Hong Kong Knowledge Management Society is doing. Um, I'm currently in London. I'm working with a number of people in the international groups here, and we've got a program for you from September onwards, talking about uh, the KM cookbook. We'll be talking about ISO practices in KM, and we'll talk about conversational leadership in a series of, of webinars that we run until the end of the year. So, Eric, uh, maybe just a final word from you as our, as our star speaker for the day. Well, um... I dispute about the fact of star speaker, but uh, anyway, I, I love to have this opportunity and thank you very much. I uh, value your presence and hopefully we have uh, more practice and more opportunities for sharing to, uh, in the near future. And I'm sure I'll be able to connect with you physically and virtually uh, in, uh, in the near future. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. <laughs> Bye everybody. Please do the survey for us. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. You,